in this video we're going to summarize the why does your kettle boil topic from everyday physics. In this video we're going to summarize what you've learned from looking at why water in your kettle boils. So first of all we looked at temperature and heat. We said that temperature and heat are not the same thing. Temperature is a measure of the total internal energy which is stored within a substance. So temperature is measured in kelvins or in degrees Celsius. To convert from degrees Celsius to kelvins, we need to subtract off 273. Temperature has an absolute minimum value. This minimum value is zero kelvins, which is called absolute zero. And in classical physics, this is the temperature at which all motion ceases. Heat, on the other hand, is a form of energy. So we can transfer heat from one body to another body. Heat is always transferred from the warmer body to the cooler body. There's three main ways that heat can be transferred. The first of these is conduction. The amount of heat which is conducted is given by the power, which is the heat over the time, is equal to K, which is the thermal conductivity constant, times A, the surface area or the cross-sectional area through which the heat is being transferred, over, times the change in temperature, divided by the length over which the heat is being transferred. The, another way heat can be transferred is convection. Convection occurs because as we heat a body, it becomes less dense, and as it becomes less dense, it rises. And so this causes convection currents to occur and distribute the heat. The final method of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation is much smaller than the other methods, but is the only way that works in the vacuum. So the amount of heat transferred through radiation is given by sigma, which is Stefan's constant, times A, the surface area, times E, the emissivity, which is some constant between 0 and 1, times the temperature of the surrounds to the power of 4, minus the temperature of the object to the power of 4. So those are the three methods of heat transfer. We've seen that in a kettle, the kettle gains energy from the electricity. When it's turned on, this electricity heats up an element inside the kettle. So the resistance of the element causes it to heat up. That heat is then transferred through conduction to, in this case, the plate on the bottom of the kettle. But not all kettles have a plate like this. Some just have the element which is in direct contact with the water. The heat is then transferred through conduction and convection to the water. And it's that transfer of heat which causes the water to heat up. If we turn off the kettle once it's finished, it then cools down as it's conducting heat to the air around it and so losing heat. It also can set up convection currents in the air around it and it can also radiate the heat, though this is a slower process. Less heat is lost through radiation than the other methods. Next, we looked at how that heat can actually change the temperature of the water. We said this was related to the specific heat. So the heat added to the water is equal to the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the change in temperature of the water. This actually works for any substance. We said that heat was also needed to change the state of the substance. So when the kettle starts to boil, Heat goes into changing the water molecules from liquid into a gas. So that is called the latent heat of vaporization. The amount of heat which is needed to change the state of a substance is given by the mass of the substance that we want to change the state of times the latent heat, and that's the latent heat of either fusion or vaporization, depending on what we want to do to the substance. Now, we saw that water was a very special substance for a few different reasons. First of all, water has an especially high specific heat, which is very lucky for us here on Earth, as the Earth, so much of the Earth's surface is covered in water. And this is a very effective means of absorbing some of the energy and so of moderating temperature fluctuations on the Earth. 
Water is also special because unlike most substances, most substances expand as they are heated. Water does above 4 degrees C, but below 4 degrees C, water actually expands as it cools. So this is why we always get ice forming on the top of ponds rather than at the bottom of ponds. Ice is also special because it is less dense than water and so will float on water. With most substances, the solid form is actually more dense than the liquid form. So we're lucky that this happens because it allowed life to evolve on Earth as when we have extreme temperature changes, when it gets extremely cold, we get a layer of ice forming on top of the ocean or on top of ponds and that as, acts as an insulating layer and it slows down the loss of heat from the water below. So the water below will stay at around about 4 degrees Celsius. We also had a look at some experimental techniques. We saw that it was very important to always perform an experiment safely. So we always need to consider what could go wrong, what risks do we need to account for before we conduct an experiment. We also saw that it was very important to minimise the number of variables that we are changing. We need to try and keep everything apart from the variable that we are changing and the variable which is dependent on that variable constant. We also saw that graphing was a very useful technique when conducting an experiment. Drawing a graph and calculating the gradient of the line of best fits allows us to approximate our data and take the statistical average of the different results, which is very useful. So I hope you've enjoyed this topic and next time you boil the kettle for a cup of tea, have a think about all the physics which is going on behind the scenes and making your cup of tea with the boiling water possible. Special thanks to Sebastian Fripp for filming this video.